Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. On behalf of the Forum of Federations, it's my privilege to welcome you all to our panel on state fragility and federalism. This is the second, second event in our 20th anniversary series looking at the future of federalism. Uh, truthfully, the 20th anniversary of the Forum was actually last year in 2020. However, because of the pandemic, we couldn't organize an international conference to celebrate this. And as the pandemic has, has dragged on, we felt that it was important to have a discussion around various facets of federalism as we look forward. The topic today is fragile states. Fragile states pose a unique challenge for the development community. While no two are identical, fragile states are more likely to experience higher rates of poverty, violence, regional instability, social and ethnic division, and weak or missing institutions. Over the last 20 years, in many fragile states, in many transitioning states, tools such as devolution, decentralization, and federalism are gaining increasing currency. A release a report in 2018 entitled The Pathways of Peace, jointly produced by the United Nations and the World Bank, provides a very significant recognition of the importance of federalism and decentralization in contributing to a reduction in state fragility. It plainly asserts that federalism, as well as federal type arrangements, have proven effective in many cases in reducing local violent conflict, where there is horizontal inequity, inequity amongst groups. 30 years ago, both academics and practitioners had a very binary view of federalism. The world was either federal or not, and federalism was restricted largely to the study of provincial federal relations. As the idea of federalism, decentralization, devolution has gained great attraction as a tool for conflict management, we've been forced as practitioners to reassess our approach. First, political systems exist on a continuum and no two systems, federal or, other, or otherwise, are alike. Indeed, several countries have borrowed from the federalism toolkit without necessarily labeling themselves as federal. Second, in the last 20 to 20, 25 years, many federations have provided constitutional recognition to local government. This is true both of established as well as emerging democracies. And several countries have adopted what is commonly known as an hourglass model of federalism with strong national governments and strong local governments combined with either weak or absent provincial governments. We have with us today a very distinguished panel of practitioners from four countries who will speak about their experiences about the role that federalism and local government can play in efforts to build state resilience in fragile contexts. Let me start by introducing the panel. We have with us uh, this morning, uh, Ambassador Ruth Huber, Ambassador and Assistant Director General of the Swiss Development Corporation and Head of the Department of Co Cooperation with Eastern Europe from Switzerland. We have with us Mr. Abdi Ayente, former Federal Minister from the Ministry of Planning and International Cooperation of the Government of Somalia and the founder of the Heritage Institute. Ms. Muna Lukman, founder of the organization Food for Humanity and co-founder of the Women in Solidarity Network from Yemen. And I hope he will join us uh, shortly. Oh, he has, uh, wonderful. <laughs> uh, ambassador Bob Ray, ambassador and Canada's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York and founding chair of the Forum of Federations. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. I'm, I'm very conscious uh, that we are operating under a time constraint. Uh, I know that both Ambassador Ray and Ambassador Huber have meetings to go to after this. And I certainly don't want our time to intrude into the iftar that uh, Ms. Lukman and Mr. Ayente will probably be celebrating in, in, a, in a couple of hours from now. So I will try and keep this uh, discussion moving along. Uh, the format will be as follows. All, I, I will pose uh, two sets of questions to all participants, uh, which should take us to about 40, 45 minutes. I'll, I'll ask uh, each one to spend about five minutes answering each one of those questions. And then that should give us about 15, uh, 15 to 20 minutes for a question and answer session where we can collect questions from, uh, from, from the audience. Uh, for those of us watching us on live stream, we have an English stream and a French stream, and I would encourage you to 
uh, to log into uh, the the comment section on uh, on on YouTube or on uh, Facebook, depending on what you're following us on, uh, to pose your questions, which will then be fed to me. So thank you again for joining us uh, today for this event. Uh, let me start with the first question to Ambassador Ray. Uh, Ambassador Ray, given your own experience in politics, federally, provincially, uh, as well as working in countries that are, that, that are fragile, and given your role now in the United Nations, uh, what do you think are the opportunities and challenges for, fed for a federal or decentralized system of governance in supporting and sustaining peace in fragile countries? Well, thank you very much, uh, Rupak, for the opportunity to join the group today. And, and I apologize for not being able to, um, to stay as long as I would like to, to listen to uh, a range of questions. But I, I, think, uh, I think the main challenge is, is are, are twofold. One is, um, I'm a great believer that every country, every community, every society has to find its own way to its own sets of compromises and um, and arrangements that reflect the realities of the country, uh, and and I think it's one of the problems that we've had over the years is that sometimes federalism is seen as kind of a foreign import. Uh, somebody suggesting that you know in the in the enthusiasm of constitution making that happened after the particularly after the collapse of of the of the Soviet Union and of the Eastern Bloc and, and other elements after that, we've tended, we've, I think we've allowed the argument to persist that, um, you know, countries are going around trying to, trying to sell their constitution to other countries and, and that doesn't work. Uh, it, it's a, it, the, the exercise of making good governance work and making constitutions work is a domestic exercise. It's not a, it's not a, a foreign imposed exercise. And every country will find its own its own way, uh, and I think that's the first thing that's that's really important to stress. There is no cookie cutter model of of federalism or of decentralization. Uh, the, the second is that um, pluralism and the recognition that the distinction, the distinctiveness of the other, uh, is. I believe a very profound fact of politics. It's a very basic element in any human society is finding, finding and, and, being, and being prepared to accept differences, whether they're religious differences, ethnic differences, linguistic differences, and understanding that the imposition of uh, power by one group over another is, is not, healthy and and always creates the potential for deeper for deeper conflict so the conversation has to take place around um, a combination of of of, of uh, if you like i think four things one is you know peace order and good government the classic sort of canadian formula that we've looked at over the years why is why are peace order and good government important uh, but the final one is rights uh, and understand or uh, recognizing pluralism. And, and that I think is the element that has to be added in. And the trick of the, 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 the job in any one of these arrangements is providing for enough, enough flexibility that you recognize difference and the need for local empowerment or for the empowerment of different linguistic groups or national groups but also the need for coordination, for stability, and for, for a commitment to, uh, to order. And to do that in a way that is not authoritarian is not easy. Um, uh, so it's, 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 it's a challenging exercise, but why is this important? Because the, what is it that creates fragility? Well, we know it's, it's poverty, it's, 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 it's climate change, it's the impact of, of imperialism, the colonial experience, and the fact that you know the, the the aftermath of colonialism is often quite chaotic. It's not ordered. It's it's frequently chaotic. So then you have to sort of people have to begin to uh, begin to focus on well, how are we going to create some degree of order out of this out of this situation? And uh, it's never an easy path. 
uh, because it's linked to development and it's linked to economic growth. Um, and, and, it, and these things never happen in a vacuum. There are other countries and other, uh, other uh, uh, instruments. Plus you have the, the problem now of, of, of extremism uh, and, and, and how, how that is created and how that is fostered in particularly in a, in a younger generation that is, uh, that is eager for work and for opportunity. And, and uh, if, if they don't find it, then frequently they'll find false hope in, in, in other ideologies. So it's, you know, like everything in life, it's complicated, but I, but I do think that federalism has, uh, as the idea, the concept, not, not the model, but the concept is based in something pretty profound in human nature uh, that we have to, I think we have to continue to reflect on. Thank you, Ambassador Ray. Uh, Ambassador Huber, a slightly modified version of that question. I mean, Switzerland is one of the world's oldest federations, but of course, uh, a very important uh, building block of Swiss federalism are your communes, your gamines. In, in that sense, uh, what do you think uh, is the role that local government or empowered local governments can play in developing countries, particularly uh, with the view of sustaining peace in fragile contexts? Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Rupak, and thank you to, to, the, for the, for, to the Forum of Federation for this opportunity to speak here in uh, the name of STC, Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Uh, yeah, as you pointed out, uh, we have, we do have a federal system in Switzerland, a strong federal uh, system with uh, strong mechanisms for inclusion and participation, a direct democracy. I consider that the experience with this, uh, our own system is an added value that Switzerland can contribute, but we don't see federalism as the solution to every context. We rather focus on local governance, strengthening local governance or multi-level governance. And as Ambassador Ray just po pointed out, we are also convinced that a well-functioning and a sustainable local governance system needs a good understanding of the local context. It needs local ownership. It's not about copying our, our system, even if we surely are influenced influenced by our uh, own um, uh, direct democracy and federal system. So what makes strengthening local governance a successful approach for sustainable development and for sustaining peace? Our experience shows that in our efforts to sustain peace, the sub-national level is a suitable entry point for tackling root causes of conflict and inequality and for fostering good governance. The local level is finally where the national policies meet the people and the people's aspirations. So and local governance provides the formal structures of engagement of the civil society in dialogue and decision-making, and this bears the potential for more inclusive and responsive policies and and government services. Um, local governance creates more legitimate and broad-based governance structures, which ultimately foster trust and favor reconciliation. So at the local level, uh, fostering cooperation in problem solving is much easier and um, that can um, avoid confronting each other with identity-based grievances. Actually, I would like to take the example of Nepal, where, where SDC has been active for a long time. Nepal Paul offers an encouraging example. The federal structure that emerged from the peace and constitutional processes in Nepal provide competencies, important competencies to the subnational levels. Uh, fiscal transfers, uh, laws and coordination mechanisms have been put in place that clarify the roles and responsibilities at the different levels. The new federal structure represents really the backbone to sustaining peace in Nepal. And now speaking from a, a development partner's point of view, in this institutional context, SDC's program focuses in all our development projects on contributing to federal state building. If we take the example of our support to technical and vocational education and training, for example, TVET, even supporting a TVET system always includes the support to defining the roles and the responsibilities and the financing schemes of the different institutions at all the levels, from local, provincial to national level. And you, I could take examples from other thematic domains where always this um, contribution to, the, to strengthening the federal state is, is built in. Uh, let me still come to the challenges uh, quickly. 
challenge is linked to the promotion of decentralization in post-conflict contexts. We, we are convinced that redesigning the political systems and institution is only one side of the coin. It's not sufficient to overcome fragility. The other side is the commitment, the political will of the political actors at the different levels, the willingness to more inclusive and responsive processes. Um, I, I could take the example of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, which um, shows some of these examples. Uh, in Bosnia, the federal structure of two entities um, the federal structure is of two entities that are aligned to the ethnic majorities, and that bears the risk for persistent ethnocentric politics that continue then to nurture the, the cleavages in, in society. Actually, I was in, in Sarajevo just a few weeks back and I was struck by the maps, uh, two maps that then our national program officer showed to me. The one, the distribution of the ethnic, main ethnic, uh, ethnic groups across the country before the war and then in 1998 after the Dayton agreements and the resulting landscape of ethnic groups with their, in their own territories, gives a visual explanation why there are so many blockages at national level when it comes to intergovernmental coordination and to joint decision making. The national level often finds itself hampered or blocked in uh, advancing policies because the entities aligned to ethnic groups have a quasi veto role and, and they lack a joint willingness for, co for cooperation. Just perhaps to conclude, I, I would like to, hi uh, to highlight the following points from our experience, inclusive and responsive local governance surely works in favor of reducing inequalities and in favor of promoting social inclusion. It can often tackle root causes of conflicts and fragility, but there are limitations to the extent to which institutional design, just by institutional design, uh, peace can be sustained. That is clearly limited. Decentralized governance alone cannot resolve all the fields of tension. And I'm speaking actually about the quality of political processes that we consider as most important. And when I speak of quality, I refer to the way a decentralized governance system is implemented, how it is lived. Uh, that means actually the, the, um, that shows the importance of the principles of good governance, that they are crucial. The participation, non-discrimination, transparency, accountability, and an effective rule of law. So how such a system is lived, uh, the quality of it is more important than the design in itself. I would stop here for the first one. Thank you, Ambassador de Hoover. I'm going to segue this uh, uh, from your discussion into asking uh, Mr. Allende, uh, one of the uh, Somalia is perhaps uh, unique in, in, in terms of a fragile state where federalism is explicitly on the agenda as, uh, a, a, as, as, a, as, a, as a way of uh, restructuring the country, reuniting the country. But clearly in recent times, there have been a lot of challenges, including what, is, what has happened over the course of the last few weeks. Um, so if I might ask you to comment a little bit on the prospects for a, for a federal uh, Somalia and, and the challenges that you see therein. Yes, thank you. Good morning um, to you, Rupak. Good afternoon and evening to some colleagues. Uh, it's a real uh, honor to join you for this very important uh, uh, dialogue. Um, allow me to say that, you know, to set the um, a frame and say that in the Somali context, federalism was adopted uh, about 15 years ago into our federal constitution. Um, and it was adopted precisely because it was seen as a mechanism to bring the country back together. A country that was emerging from uh, over a decade of civil war and essentially statelessness. And this was seen as an opportunity to uh, really recreate, reimagine um, a nation. Now, of course, Somalia is a relatively small country, not in geographical terms, but the population is about 15 million. Uh, people and most federal countries around the world, as you know, are tend to be quite big and, and complex. And Somalia is also one of the most homogeneous countries, uh, 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 probably in Africa. Um, some 95% of the population is for, of a Somali ethnic. Uh, everyone speaks, nearly everyone speaks the same language. Almost everyone is Muslim and, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's more commonalities among Somalis than you would find in other federal um, contexts. Now, 
there were uh, there are a number of opportunities associated with federalism in the context of Somalia. I would say it's more of a three-dimensional opportunities. The first and most important dimension is the reconciliation dimension. Um, federalism has had a profound uh, stabilizing effect in, in our country in that it really allowed communities across the country to run their affairs uh, largely autonomously from the central government. And this is precisely because the civil war was caused by an overly centralized militari militarized dictatorship that um, uh, try to dominate everyone across the country. And by nature, if you read about Somalis, uh, Somalis are not only egalitarian, but uh, very individualistic, very nomadic, to the point where some scholars uh, say that it bo really borders um, uh, you know, uh, chaotic in some ways, because the average Somali who lives in the, in, the, in the countryside, which is still the majority of the population, maybe over 65 to 70% of the population is still living in the countryside, uh, are living in this very harsh environments where they have to act largely independently alone um, and have to fetch for themselves. And so you, uh, for that precise reason, I think really federalism uh, uh, tends to work uh, for Somalis. Uh, so that's the first dimension, which is the reconciliation uh, dimension and the stability factor that it had on the country. The second um, dimension, I think, is, in, is that federalism really uh, allowed Somalis to receive uh, local government services at the, at the locality, something that wasn't the case, again, in the central government of Siad Barre in the 70s and 80s, which was a very strong government, but nonetheless failed to deliver basic services at the local level, whether it's education, health, or, or basic um, municipal uh, activities. Now that has changed quite dramatically where you have uh, Somalis across the country really receiving that services at the very local level. The third um, element is related um, to the, uh, uh, to uh, what I would say is resource sharing, which is another important factor. And uh, this is both natural resources as well as the revenue of the country. Now that is now a work in progress, but the design of federalism in our country was to uh, again, allow um, for communities to be able to generate resources and revenues at the local level. Uh, that's federal member states. That's what we call them. You would call them uh, uh, provincial governments in other countries or states in the US. Um, our federal member states are now largely able to generate revenues on their own and support their local um, administration. So those are the three dimensional opportunities that federalism has created for our country. What are the challenges? Well, there are also profound challenges confronting federalism in, in our society. The first and perhaps the most complex one in my view is that uh, because it's a new system of governance in our country, it, it the design of it is still a, a work in progress. Our constitution remains in provisional state for now over 10 years because our political elite um, cannot agree on the design of federalism uh, one way or the other. I mean, we have the broad framework of federalism, but how to actually translate that into um, uh, whether it's physical transfers or um, sharing of uh, resources and power uh, between the member states and between the federal government remains a work in progress. So that's a major challenge, one that is going to be with us uh, in the foreseeable future because it is deeply linked to issues of reconciliation, state building and peace building. The second uh, uh, profound challenge we have uh, with federalism is that it to this day remains a, a, a binary for the average Somali citizen in that you have a federal government based in the capital Mogadishu, quite weak um, in relative terms to the member states. Uh, and then you have relatively also weak but strong uh, member states in their locality that are governing from the state capitals. But you do not have, what you do not have in our current federal structure is local governments. And that's the hourglass that you were referring to Rupak earlier, which I think is fundamental, especially for providing services, whether it's security, health, education, or the basic functions of government that is now lacking. There are now encouraging signs across the country where uh, some states are now starting to uh, launch 
local elections for the purpose of creating independent local gov governments. And that is now, uh, we are now at the beginning stage of that. But that, is, that, that remains a fundamental challenge. One that is really frustrating for the average citizen because uh, as much as citizens would like to be within a federal member state that broadly reflects their political values, they also would want to benefit directly from mem uh, federal member states by having services at the local level, at the district level, um, or having elected leadership at their local levels, which currently they're lacking. Um, the third and, and final challenge we have is a very poor understanding of federalism among the Somali public. And that's an important function that we have now come to learn and appreciate the importance of, of uh, um, you know, public education or federalism. We are, uh, we used to be one of the, uh, as I said, a strong central state, a military dictatorship that essentially um, uh, raised, uh, uh, really, you know, um, taught the public, you know, even when I was in primary school in Mogadishu, I was taught that one system of governance was great for the country. And so you continue to see a, a very strong resistance among the average citizens, not among the political elite who now have bought into the idea of federalism, but among the average citizens that federalism is a bad deal for the country. And, and we, you know, when I ran a, a think tank in the country, we did a, a year long study on this issue. And it was a very interesting study because when you ask people, what do you think about federalism? Uh, the, the, uh, the response was almost uh, uh, you know, a large proportion of our citizens basically said it, it was bad for the country. But when you ask them to describe what type of government they would like to see, they would give a, an almost uh, perfect description of federalism. So they do want the dividends of federalism. They just don't like the word of it because it has a negative connotation relating to how it was introduced into Somalia in 2004 which was a top-down model by political actors who simply just introduced it to the public without any consultations. But it was also the strong influence of Ethiopia that um, contributed to the introduction of federalism into Somalia. Um, and keep in mind that Ethiopia is a, is a long-standing adversary of Somalia now for 60 or 70 years. And it, it is it, it dominated our uh, political um, scene for many years. And, and so Somalis are very resentful of the idea that a neighboring rival country uh, uh, it has introduced this idea. Now, of course, Ethiopia practices a different model of federalism, it's ethnic federalism. Um, I don't think it's working quite well right now as we know very well. Uh, ours is some people say it's more of a clan-based uh, federalism, although that is disputable. Whatever the case is, we need to do a lot better of, of uh, really educating our public about um, uh, federalism. So those are sort of the opportunities and challenges. Back to you, Rupak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ayante. Uh, wonderful way to segue now to the situation in Yemen and Ms. Luqman. Uh, clearly, federalism is a contested idea in Yemen. It caused the latest round of, uh, or, or how the country would be divided up, uh, caused the latest round of fighting in Yemen. Uh, but, I, but there seems to be a widespread recognition amongst the various groups that uh, whether you call it, you know, again, to, uh, to, to draw on what Mr. Ante said, it, regardless of what you call the system, there is some recognition that there has to be, uh, in order to keep the country united, there has to be some kind of system of power sharing uh, or devolution or decentralization. So if, uh, if I might ask you to comment a little bit on that and drawing on your own professional background, uh, say, 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 uh, you know, uh, say a little bit about the role you think that uh, women's uh, organizations can, uh, can play in, in, in peace building in the context of Yemen. Well, uh, thank you um, uh, everyone and thank you Rupak. Um, I would like to first of all congratulate um, uh, the forum on the uh, 20th or 21st anniversary. Um, I remember in, um, in uh, 2013, uh, there were several capacity building sessions uh, to inform the illustrations or, uh, or the design of governance uh, models in Yemen. Um, I remember uh, that there was a successful um, uh, initiative uh, by the governor Shoki Hail in Taz, and it was also coordinated with the forum. Um, and those, I call them, were the golden days. <laughs> uh, we had so many aspirations. Uh, uh, we had the strong leadership on the ground. 
uh, I, I'm talking about the governance level. And um, we managed to overcome many obstacles and uh, also serious violations and clashes uh, that happened after the Arab Spring. Uh, at the same time, um, it was happening the national dialogue, an eight month long uh, national dialogue conference with subcommittees to, uh, to discuss the various models of uh, uh, federalism and devolved uh, governance. Uh, um, in, in 2014, um, it was introduced uh, very similarly to what um, Minister Abdi was speaking about um, with a lot of public resistance because there wasn't any communication beforehand uh, to, the, to the people. So people really resisted it and thought it was a foreign uh, imposing uh, this uh, model. Um, and although the elite had somewhat um, uh, discussed in, in, in somewhat uh, depth, but without any real mechanisms, without the details. And at that time at the National uh, Dialogue, um, the resentments really um, had more underlying causes, um, such as injustice, grievances, the Southern issue, economic and military um, uh, disputes, and, um, and corruption, and there were so many other issues. So these included also the gaps in the rule of law, the basic rights protection, weak government institutions, and poor governance in general. And like I said, the widespread corruption in every single uh, institute. Um, this had led to um, other social and, and rights issues also, which also included women. Um, at that time, we had a good, um, um, I would say outcome, which was the 30% quota for women's participation. The child marriage um, was also highlighted and focused and uh, it was really um, a successful point for many women's rights issues. Unfortunately, uh, now we have gone back uh, several years back backwards. Um, the, the main failing uh, was that um, the proposal of federalism um, lacked a mechanism which the national uh, re uh, resources, the, the revenues, uh, would be distributed among some of the various regions. Uh, specifically here, I would say that the Houthi controlled areas or the Houthi movement was very, and uh, also the Northern um, uh, people were really um, upset that they would be landlocked uh, and uh, would not have any access to seaports or or any resources from uh, which were mainly in the south. So this caused a lot of fragmentation. The Houthi movement uh, uh, took by force and uh, made the uh, coup against the government of Yemen. They ousted the, the um, president. And here we are seven years later. Uh, unfortunately, the conflict escalated. The Saudi-led um, military coalition came in. And uh, now we're in a state of a bloody, deadly civil war with the regional and international uh, proxy elements. Um, since then, uh, realities on the ground have really changed um, significantly. Um, first of all, the prolonged violence and protracted um, uh, political and military stalemate have also resulted in a situation in which some form of federalism might be um, unavoidable now uh, in Yemen. Um, and I think that uh, there are many political forces in, for instance, the southern uh, of Yemen, the south of Yemen, uh, who, are, who were aligned with the um, Hadi government against the Houthis, have now increased their call for autonomy and independence and, um, and even secession. Um, and the Southern Transitional um, Council uh, in, um, in the south, which are mainly baked, uh, backed by the um, United Arab Emirates, uh, they control many of the areas where uh, much of the um, gas rich and oil rich um, areas are such as uh, Marib, Hadramaut and many regions in the South. Now the, the, southern, um, in, uh, the southern cause um, has a lot of justice in it also and legal um, justice because there was a lot of um, uh, grievances there, uh, they had many issues and they were under, um, uh, overlooked. And it led at the end uh, from 2007, um, all these demands led to um, violence after that. 
And um, so, so this is really uh, irreversible now. And it seems that uh, people might be uh, more open to federalism um, than they were uh, in 2014. Um, this is my own personal judgment. So um, right now, the situation, the economy has completely, of course, collapsed. The uh, deadly conflict in Marib uh, is uh, the spotlight or hot uh, spot right now. Uh, thousands of families are fleeing for the second and third time because of the Houthi escalation uh, and fighting there. And so um, when we go back and see what went wrong, what happened, and what can we um, uh, how can we move on now from him, from this conflict? Um, myself and many uh, people in Yemen think that uh, the grievances haven't had their uh, focus, um, including um, uh, uh, including the services in, in Yemen, including security, justice, the underlying causes of the conflict, poverty, uh, lack of development projects. Um, so all of these have led really to, and they're still uh, right now um, the same in the same position. It's just going backwards and backwards. We have a government, which uh, a newly uh, appointed government that doesn't even have one woman uh, in there. So it's taking us back 20 years backwards. Um, development has also gone um, out of, completely out of the strategic um, plans of the government. Uh, no uh, services, nothing. So really, um, when we go back to see what really went wrong, it was really um, mainly that the, the, there wasn't a real mechanism. Uh, the uh, institutions, the government institutions, the judiciary um, system, all of it was corrupted. There wasn't, it was all centralized uh, for many, many years. And um, the political elite and the tribal elites were controlling everything and still are controlling everything. So it will be very difficult to have um, federalism um, as a useful model right now in Yemen because we don't have the base anymore, the base of local governance, the base of the, um, the, uh, the local councils on the ground. We have a very um, strong law for the local council, but it's not implemented. And this was mainly most of the problems that we had in, in Taz, where we tried to overcome these obstacles, but it was so centralized. You couldn't even do anything without the central government. Uh, and so really um, to conclude, I would say that uh, without the, the major focus on, um, uh, on strengthening the local capacity of the local uh, councils on the ground, and decentralizing it in a way where the resources are really, and the revenues are used by the local councils in an effective way. Um, and, in a, um, and also where the core elite and the wider population are dealt with um, equally. Without that, um, it, we will still have another failure of federalism if we don't set the record straight from, from the beginning. I also want to add about reconciliation as uh, Minister Abdi also, that we also, um, this is, um, I think this is an, um, an emergent um, or an, uh, it's, it's just such an important um, factor that I think the international community and the UN led peace process are overlooking. We, we are just building on grievances and violations all the time and people are not ready, are not, uh, ready to to really um, get involved into another um, stage of maybe federalism where they perceive it as a separation, they perceive it as a um, uh, an imposing from from another country or from uh, regional countries and international community. So I think that we really need to address the meaning in a meaningful way um, the grievances uh, of diff different Yemeni groups. I also think that um, the provision of basic services and economic uh, situation, uh, especially at the local levels, is also um, an immediate need. Um, even if a lasting ceasefire can be arranged in Yemen and the mediation um, uh, reignites again or uh, um, rehappens again, without the basic services, the people will continue to fight, will continue to, be, um, to join, uh, the warlords, unfortunately, because they are also supporting these people. And so uh, we need to really um, um, open the 
discussion in a more deeper way uh, and have a comprehensive, inclusive peace process that really addresses the grievances on the ground. Over to you, Rupat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lukman. You've you've raised uh, uh, an issue that Mr. Raised, uh, that Ambassador Ray started with about uh, uh, about having a process that is seen as being domestically owned, uh, and and in this context, uh, Ambassador Ray, uh, as as somebody who is um, uh, who is part of the Global North uh, and a development partner from the Global North, what do you see as uh, the most effective way? as donors to engage in these sorts of processes uh, in, 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 in the Global South. You're muted. The, 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 um, the first one I think is, is, is we, we need to establish a much stronger capacity uh, to, uh, to listen and to learn. Um, I think if you look at this historically, there was a lot of, well, historically, going back, I mean, imperialism, colonialism is, is all about hubris. It's all about thinking that, you know, we'll, we'll tell people what to do. We're superior. Our civilization is superior. Our education is, is better. So we'll dominate all these countries and tell them what to do. And we'll work one local group against another, and we'll just basically run the show. Um, decolonization um, supposedly was, was intended to take care of that problem. Uh, but frankly, um, uh, imperial habits die hard. They don't disappear easily. Um, and I think in the, in, the, in the global north, there's still a sense that, uh, you know, we, we can come and tell, you know, explain to people what to do and they'll do it. And that doesn't, it just, it doesn't work. Um, the, the local politics, the regional politics, the dynamics uh, in every part of the world are extremely complex. Uh, they have to be understood. They have to be appreciated. Um, you need to use both ears and, and just keep your mouth shut. I mean, that's the first thing I would tell people is just listen. Listen, read, learn, understand, uh, and, and, and try to figure out what is really happening here? What is what is actually going on? And and I think the you know listening to uh, to the conversation today, which I think is an excellent conversation, it really reinforces the the sense that that, that you know when I when, when I did some work in Sri Lanka many years ago, we used to refer to federalism as the F word. You know, don't say the word, don't use the word, don't don't speak the word because it's seen as a foreign export or import. Uh, and and it, it, it's seen as something that's of interest to the elites or it's of interest to somebody else. The second thing is, um, as a development partner, don't take sides. Um, you're being asked to uh, help to presumably engage initially in a, in a mediation process but when we look at you know, the, the conflict in Yemen or, or the, the conflict in, in, in Somalia, which is, they're each different. You, you can't go in and say, well, I, I know what that's all about because I, I was over there before and we can do it here. This, here's the model that we apply. No, it's not like that. It's, it's understanding uh, the differences. Having said that, <clears throat> in order to have a country at all, you need to have some glue. There has to be some emotional glue that keeps people together. And you need to figure out if that's there. Um, if it's not there, we, we should stop worshiping at the altar of the nation state and say that we, you know, this state has to stay together no matter what. Uh, not necessarily. The point is to save lives. The point is to end conflict and to see to what extent we can create common institutions that that have the glue. And I think that's what Ruth was really talking about when she said it's not about the design of institutions. Uh, it's not an exercise in engineering or mechanical drawing it's, or architecture. Uh, it's about listening and understanding how the local structures need to change. Um, Rupak, uh, you know, the, the, the British had a certain model in mind for the Indian constitution. Uh, which the Indian people decided after 10 years 
or even less, was not going to work. It wasn't going to work for them. It was going to create more, putting different ethnic groups in the same state was not necessarily going to diminish conflict. It was simply going to increase the conflict in, in the number of states. So they said, no, we have to redraw the boundaries of the states so that they reflect some degree of ethnic homogeneity and some degree of, of, of political culture that's similar that can actually be made to work. It's complicated, difficult to do. There will always be elements of minorities within majorities. That's always going to be a question. But that's a decision that the Indian government made and the Indian people made to say, this is, this is what we want. Uh, and, and there has to be that understanding that we can't impose a design on anyone, on anyone else. But I mean, one of, the, one of the important gifts of mediation and of, of, uh, of, of doing this, this kind of work uh, is, is understanding that there is no one single model, but there are some common things you need to look for. <clears throat> I think we've discussed some of them today. One of them is the capacity of local government uh, and the extent to which uh, local governments can, can, can work. Second is the role of women. Uh, I think it's really critical to understand that it, this is not a man's game anymore. It, it, you know, it should never have been, but it certainly isn't now. And if you ignore uh, the, the role that women play in every society uh, and how, that, how those voices have been, have been often you know, put to the side and not listened to, but if you listen to those voices, you will hear some new, new elements of insight into what is it that's going to make a difference in allowing allowing for things to move, uh, to move forward. Uh, effective governance at the national level, assuming there is a national level, uh, requires relationships between and among um, different ethnic and linguistic and religious groups, uh, tribal groups. If there's no glue there, there's no glue there. And, and if you create a nation state on top of no glue, you have what Ruth described in Sarajevo, what we see in Lebanon, where, which is where the situation is just stuck and every group has a veto and there is no effective movement forward uh, because there's just no ability to get the, the national government structures to work in a way that's sufficiently flexible. Um, I guess my last point would be to say that uh, having said all this, um, I think there is one sort of universal truth, and that is that governance actually matters. <laughs> and there isn't one model of governance, like there's not one institutional design of governance, but having governance really matters. Because if we're going to have, have societies function and they're going to function peacefully, you need to understand the sources of conflict. You need to create the approaches that will help to resolve the conflicts and provide for a basis for, uh, for stability and for peaceful relationships. But you, you do need to recognize the one universal thing I would say is not just the one, but, but governance matters. And, and so you, you need to reinforce with people's senses, we're not telling you which model to, 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 to pick, but I mean, obviously, in, in the modern world, I mean, in, in our world today, uh, the country, you know, country like Canada is not going to be saying, and we think in your country, we think a military authoritarian dictatorship would work best. That is going to happen. Canada's not going to do that. There may be other countries that come in and say, yeah, well, that's, you know, we're happy to do that. Uh, and I, although I kept saying it, I said that was my last point. Then my last point is you have to always take into account the external influences and understand that no country functions uh, in a vacuum. Uh, and the global politics are complicated and difficult. Power politics are complicated and difficult. Economics plays a role. Debt plays a role. Resource revenue plays a role. Uh, foreign aid plays a role of one kind or another. Um, you know, sometimes we fall over each other. The donors are all trying to sort of bring in money and doing things and we don't coordinate our assistance well enough. Not everybody's assistance is transparent. Some countries are engaging in ways that do not, do not meet the test of transparency or, 
or are not public. Uh, there are arms that are being uh, exported and imported. There's the creation of client groups and, and uh, the imposition of, uh, of, of various extremist ideologies and the introduction of those. It's extremely complicated. And, and I think we should stop pretending that this is a, you know, there's a simple model and we know what to do. And I, I think to be fair, I, know, I think if you talk to people at the UN now, I think, I think the conversations are much more kind of broad based and, and uh, thoughtful than they were at one time. I think we went through, we've gone through different waves and hopefully we've exhausted most of the waves and just understand that to go back to where I started, just listen, try to listen to what people are saying and what you're hearing and don't, don't interrupt them. Don't interrupt the conversation when it starts, just listen because that's the most important gift that uh, I think we can, we can bring to the to the uh, to the situation, and and they are extremely bloody and difficult conflicts going on in the world, and most of them um, can be resolved, and in many cases have been resolved, um, but usually because people just get exhausted with the cost of conflict and and the pain of conflict and the the death and destruction and loss that's associated with the conflict, but hopefully we won't have to keep repeating those experiences in order to get to a, a better a better situation, a more stable situation, one that's uh, going to create better, a uh, better opportunity. Thank you, Ambassador Ray. Uh, Ambassador Huber, I'd invite you to come in on some of those issues in, in terms of how you think development partners can play a supportive and positive role. Yeah, thank you. I think I could, I can really underline or uh, could repeat many of the issues that Ambassador Ray just um, just mentioned. And and actually, I would like to say it's very very interesting to to listen to the 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 experience in in Somalia and Yemen with uh, federalist uh, systems and the limitations of it or the difficulties that it creates. Uh, I would also like to say again that it's. I agree very much with Ambassador Ray that it's not about going to teach and to copy one specific model, one single model of federalism or of, of or also of, of decentralization to, to other countries. That's really important. But so what, what can be the role of, of development partners? And, and, and let me speak about some of, of SDC's experiences, some elements or approaches in supporting not specific federalism, but local governance or well-functioning multi multi-level governance, as we like to speak about. Um, first, we are convinced that only a comprehensive and systemic approach will, will show results. That means looking at all actors within a given <clears throat> system, a given country, looking at their roles and their interests. That is particularly important in fragile countries to understand all the different fragmented um, actors and, and their interests. As said earlier, it's at the local level where the policies meet the citizens and the citizens' expectations. And it's at that level that we can find entry points for tangible cooperation. Um, STC, speaking about this comprehensive and systemic approach, STC engages or makes an effort to engage with uh, all actors, with both state and non-state actors, strengthening them in their respective governance roles. That can mean, on one hand, the local authorities that need capacities to plan, to provide services, <clears throat> to mobilize resources, manage budgets transparently, to become more responsive to citizens as well, uh, citizens and non-state actors, to be accountable for their actions, Actions that would be on the side of the local authorities. On the other hand, um, systemic engagement at local level also means including communities, civil society, local businesses, traditional structures in the governance processes. They need capacities. All those actors need capacities for effective participation, for advocacy, monitoring, holding local governments to account. So a good interaction between these different actors, state and non-state actors, enables then an inclusive and accountable local governance. And a good interaction can create like a, a virtual cycle or, or can reinforce the social contract. To, 
to illustrate this, I, I would like to take the example of Bangladesh, where complementary to the ongoing decentralization process, SDC takes the approach of um, to foster local econom economic development that with the aim to improve framework conditions for local businesses and so on. So the approach brings together the public and the private actors, engaging local governments and private sector actors in joint economic planning and um, um, strategizing and, and planning projects. So, so far in about at least 12 such schemes, collaboration between municipalities and the private sector was established. And that means also the finan finance, uh, financial resources, human resources from both sides were mobilized. An important aspect, a part of the joint funding of, of, of uh, projects that respond to the local demand, an important aspect, since we speak of sustaining peace in fragile context, context is also that this approach helps to link urban, peri-urban and rural areas to foster the well-being or the economic well-being, at least, of the overall territory to, to take in a, a broader view, a broader approach. Another point I would like to, to raise is to um, to put the local ownership of governance processes at the heart of any local governance program that has been mentioned already, the importance of local ownership. To reach local ownership or to respect local ownership, it's crucial to build upon pre-existing practices, engage all relevant actors, consider historical trajectories also, legacies that influence the current relationships between the different um, institutions or actors so it's important that local actors achieve their own context adapted forms of good governance. I think that's it, or of a, of a decentralized system. Another aspect, actually also mentioned before, sorry, is giving due attention to gender equality. Among the civilian population, it's often the women that are disproportionately um, affected or they bear disproportionately the direct and indirect consequences of violence. They are underrepresented in political bodies, have limited access and influence on decision making and so on. So very important to <clears throat> give the appropriate attention to gender equality. I could also give examples from different countries to that, how we, we try to strengthen, for example, locally elected women in Nepal as well to fully play their roles, or how we support governments in introducing gender responsive budgeting exercises in Kosovo, Kyrgyzstan, Bolivia, etc. Gender responsive budgeting to incorporate gender principles at all stages of the, of the budget process. And finally, another point I'd like to mention is development partners need to have a long breath, really work with a, a certain long, medium to long term perspective in their engagement um, for sustaining peace. There are always setbacks, there are power plays, we know that, um, but it's, it's crucial to, to stay engaged over phases of turmoil and, and stand ready to support the, the partner governments. Um, so. I'll shorten a bit. There would be many examples to give. In summary, some key approaches that I would say, based on our experience, key approaches for development partners are to adopt a comprehensive and systemic approach, engaging with state and non-state actors, foster local ownership in the governance processes, give due attention to gender equality, also foster a close coordination of peace building and development efforts, so more on the sometimes the political side of a development partner's activity and the development side side of, uh, of it. And finally, to get, engage with a long-term perspective, uh, with a long breath, as I mentioned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Ambassador Huber. Uh, uh, you know, based on what Ambassador Ray and yourself have said, I, you know, the three, I, the two or three takeaways that, that stick in my mind. One is, of course, local context matters. So, you know, listen, uh, listen to sort of, what, uh, sort of what local actors have to say. Uh, the second is, I think, labels are not important. It's about governance. So it doesn't matter, you know, to uh, not, not an apt paraphrase, but I think it's uh, particularly when we're talking about uh, democracy and federalism, but, you know, the, the old Deng Xiaoping uh, quote about uh, 
uh, it doesn't matter whether the, the, the cat is black or white as long as the cat is mice. So it doesn't matter if it's uh, fe federalism, decentralization, whatever you, uh, you want to call it, as long as it, it's, it serves the governance needs of the people who it's serving. And, and the third thing I think is, uh, uh, is profound is that this is a long, this is a long term process. Uh, I mean, just just looking uh, just looking at the global north. I mean, it, it took uh, almost seven hundred years from the Magna Carta to women getting the vote, uh, which uh, you know we're, we're not going to wait seven hundred years to uh, to to end conflict. Uh, but but I think it's it's important to put this into perspective. And the other uh, the other important thing that both uh, Ambassador Ray and uh, Ambassador Huber mentioned is the important role that women uh, uh, women play. In, 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 in building sustainable, resilient, uh, peaceful societies, uh, a demographic that has been excluded in, in the past uh, from, from playing this role. Uh, I, so I, Rupak, I, uh, Rupak, I wonder if I could just, just, just sure. interrupt with, a, with an anecdote as I often do. Yes. I, have to, I have to leave very shortly for another meeting, but I, and I'm really sorry not to be able to, 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 uh, to continue with the conversation, but I can remember uh, 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 having a discussion with a State Department official uh, when I was asked to, the forum was asked to, to go to, uh, to Iraq uh, and uh, to engage with the, the, the process that was underway in, uh, in uh, Baghdad in 2005. And um, I spent three weeks there uh, with the you know advising the UN on, on uh, how to move forward on the constitutional process, and the the American official was very impatient. He said, "Well, you know, how complicated can it be to get a constitution? You know, it doesn't take long. It's just a document. You just get it going and just get it done." And I said, "Well, actually, think back on your own history." And he looked at me and said, "I said, you know, uh, the, the the long movement to independence was was long in the making." In the 18th century, um, you know the the fights over taxes and and uh, you know over British governance really started in in, in full after the end of the, of the so-called French Indian War of the 1750s. You then had the 1760s, 1770s. You then had the Declaration of Independence. You then had a five-year civil war or war with the with the British, uh, full-out military conflict. You then had a a process, you then had the Articles of Confederation. It became clear that that wasn't gonna work because it was too decentralized. There wasn't enough glue holding the structure together. You then had, uh, you know, and I said, you didn't get a constitution. Uh, and then finally, when you got the constitution, 1787, you had the election of the president. You, you then realized that you didn't have enough strength for the Bill of Rights. You didn't have enough of a, of a rights-based structure. So you had to create that. And then you've got your ongoing, you know, stuff. And then, by the way, you had a civil war fifty years later. So, so don't talk, don't don't pretend that, that this thing is just going to take a few weeks and you're going to get it done. And you know, you're going to do, you know, bullets and then ballots and then just you know, bye bye. It doesn't work that way. You've got to have a sense of permanence. I think I think Ruth's point about the time horizon is extremely important. We're in the middle of a long process in many countries. It's painful, difficult. It, it does have a conclusion. It does get better. It does it, things can improve, but it, it's not instant. And having said that, I'm afraid I have to I have to run, but I really appreciate the opportunity to join you. It's been great. Thank you very much for joining us with me. All the best. Um, to, to sort of move on from that, uh, turning, turning to our participants in the Global South, uh, Mr. Uthman, uh, as somebody working in the area of peace and reconciliation, uh, what would what would be your expectations in terms of uh, uh, sort of international in intervention in supporting the process of peace uh, and reconciliation in Yemen? Well, I think first and foremost is that um, we need to we need a more uh, inclusive. Uh, well, first of all, before the inclusivity, we need to end the violence right now and the escalation. So we need an immediate uh, ceasefire. And um, um, in the ceasefire, we need um, monitors from the community, the civil society, including the women and the youth, because every time we have a ceasefire, there's always a mechanism, there's never a mechanism that's really in place. So the details of the ceasefire are not really there. 
the monitors of the violations and the spoilers are also um, not effective. And so that's why we fall back into violence the next day. Um, so I think the, the, the most um, uh, imperative um, uh, need for Yemen right now is to end the conflict, specifically in Marib right now, where there are more than 2 million families where IDPs were inter internally displaced. Um, so we need to end that. We need to open the humanitarian corridors. Um, people need um, food, they need water, they need medicine. COVID is spreading widely, viciously. The whole, um, um, the, all of the hospitals are running low on supplies. The infrastructure is of course uh, uh, destructed. So we need the humanitarian angle right now, first of all. And then we need to start engaging the local actors. Uh, the UN peace led uh, process is not working right now and it will not be working. And the same actions will just bring us the same results. Um, and the worst part of the peace process, although we appreciate all the work of the UN and the envoy and the uh, international community um, and all of their good intentions, but it's not working. It's actually rewarding violators, it's rewarding violence. So if you pick up arms, um, you get included. Um, and that is really giving a terrible message to so many armed fact uh, factions and non-state actors on the ground. So we need to redesign this um, uh, peace process. And I think we've already had a good example before. I'm not suggesting that we do the same national dialogue again, but uh, we can take elements from uh, the national dialogue and um, start implementing them. And I also think that there should be um, a humanitarian response specifically for Marib and for the city of Taz. These two cities are really under a lot of, um, um, uh, they're, they're really in need of uh, emergent, um, uh, emergency um, support. Um, I think that we uh, need to start looking at the women from a different angle right now. The women have been able to uh, release detainees, uh, uh, at least 1,000 something. Uh, that was the, the latest statistic that I um, saw a few months ago. I think it's much more right now. Uh, these are normal women who protest. They're mo mothers of abductees. They go, they protest, they mediate with the local tribes, they mediate with the uh, prison authorities and they, uh, their strategy is working. We need to support them. We need to include them. They should be in the talks. Um, we have very good representatives from them. Um, and they have had a lot of um, success compared to the UN-led um, um, detainee um, uh, strategy. Um, local actors, local tribes need to be also listened to. I'm um, so grateful for the words of Ambassador Bob Ray, for what he was saying about listen, listen, listen. We don't want to impose, we need the uh, real um, solutions to come from the people themselves so that they own them, they own it and they um, uh, protect it. Um, we also need to look at the economy. Uh, the economy is really uh, also feeding the violence. We have the, um, the collapse of the economy itself and then we have the war economy. And also uh, that needs to be addressed um, and it needs, <clears throat> we really need some more justice and accountability for the violators, for those warlords who are uh, contributing to the war economy and profiteering from it. Um, and uh, we need to start looking at other uh, issues such as the security sector reform and uh, governance. These issues, these um, pillars of governance should not be um, uh, delayed until after the war or post-war. We need those discussions to happen right now. I will stop there, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you've, you've raised a very uh, Im important point in discussing Yemen. And I'm just going to turn to uh, Mr. Allende. Uh, the, the balance between humanitarian, uh, immediate humanitarian support and providing long-term support for, uh, for uh, building up governance and state capacity, uh, how, 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 in your view, uh, in the context of Somalia, how do you balance that? It is a very tricky balance, without a doubt. I mean, there is a tendency to focus on the emergency issues relating to either humanitarian disasters and, and political crises and so on and so forth. But I think at the heart of this discussion is, uh, I think Ambassador Ray said this earlier, that federalism is really a, a, a framework. 
and it was designed for countries like Somalia uh, who are new to the system to really create, customize it to their own local uh, socioeconomic and political context, which is precisely what we're trying to do in our context right now. So for development partners here, I think, um, and I very much concur with what uh, Ambassador Hooper said uh, here, is uh, to do a couple of things. And I can reflect this based on my experience uh, uh, directly interacting with uh, development partners as Minister of not only planning, but also international cooperation. It was under my docket that I had the opportunity to interact with them. Uh, for, number one is, I think, um, uh, because federalism is only a framework, uh, countries like Somalia and Yemen or other fragile um, contexts should be allowed to design their own uh, federal system. There is a tendency sometimes to try and import uh, other, other federal contexts to, to fragile countries, and they just simply do not apply. I mean, we've just heard about the Swiss model which is fundamentally different to the Canadian model. I'm also an American uh, citizen, and I can tell you that here in the US, the American model is fundamentally different to uh, the German or the Indian model. So I think we should be allowed to really craft and design our own um, uh, uh, models. So that's number one, to give us a space so that we can design. And it's a, you know, error and trial. You, you know, you don't always get it right. I mean, in America, we, they continue to say toward a perfect union, and that's a, sort of a finite uh, statement if you think about it. It's probably, you're never gonna reach that uh, uh, union, perfect union, if you will. And in fact, there were um, interesting um, quote, uh, you know, by one of the uh, conservative American thinkers who said that, um, you know, the, if you read the Federalist Papers, it is about disagreement. It's about pitting faction against another faction, divided government, checks and balances, and so on. And that's what federalism is all about. So to allow that disagreement to really fester, uh, not fester, but to grow into meaningful um, discourse. So that's one element. The second uh, uh, perhaps suggestion for development partners is to um, really allow for uh, locally led solutions. I think that's connected to the first point, but the, the second point is to really give it a time. Um, you know, you mentioned the 700 uh, years uh, in, in the US context, it's about 240 years and they're still trying to perfect their union. Um, in our context, uh, our system is now only 15 years old. So it needs many more decades to perfect it, to get it to where we can all feel good about it. Um, uh, so to not rush it, again, there's a tendency to rush um, uh, the, the process of completing a federal architecture and uh, the way I see it is an ongoing dialogue. The third and perhaps uh, an important element here is to support uh, developing countries and fragile contexts to really build the knowledge base. Um, you know, we do not have an understanding of how federal system works, as I told you earlier, um, the, the, the average Somali citizen is still deeply skeptical about uh, uh, federalism as a concept because it sounds very foreign. It sounds very, um, uh, you know, uh, imposed uh, by uh, uh, external actors. And so we need to build the, the local knowledge uh, base on how to run federal systems from fiscal federalism to power sharing, resource sharing, um, and even just uh, uh, you know, uh, the relationship between local government, state governments, and federal government. So this trilateral relationship between the three levels of government. Um, and then finally, to provide um, the resources in support of our uh, locally led solutions. I think that would be another important uh, uh, suggestion for development partners, because uh, again, the, uh, there's a still a great deal of, uh, of resource uh, scarcity to run uh, uh, three levels of government, let alone um, you know, more levels of government. Mm -hmm. And that cost is more, but it increases greater participation of citizens, which uh, would then um, you know, increase uh, greater stability. And I think in, in, you know, given the fact that uh, you know, looking at other similar countries uh, emerging from conflict, whether it's Afghanistan, Iraq, or even neighboring countries like Ethiopia, uh, Sudan and others, I can say with a greater confidence that Somalia is in fact 
is a is a is a template for how to rebuild a country that has fallen and build it gradually, methodically, without really rushing it. It takes um, decades to get it to where we want, and uh, we're still perfecting um, our federal architecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jayanti. You also make a very uh, interesting interesting point uh, about. Um, uh, well, a, a that not all federal models or all models of fe federal type arrangements, I don't want to say federalism, because I don't want to sound dogmatic, but federal type models are not all the same. They're rooted in history, they're rooted in society, they're rooted in culture. Uh, but I think there's also a very uh, important aspect to that, is that um, societies change, cultures change, so nothing is static. So, so aspiring for a perfect federation is, is chasing a mirage. Uh, Switzerland of the 13th century was not the Switzerland of 1848, and certainly is not the Switzerland uh, of today. Uh, in fact, uh, in, the, in the chat box, uh, we have a, a very highly engaged audience. Uh, there are two questions about uh, Ethiopia and, uh, uh, and ethnic federalism. And you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not going to open that up for discussion at the moment. I, I, think, I think the takeaway uh, to addressing those questions is Ethiopia started with a certain model of federalism. Uh, Ethiopians have to make an assessment whether it's working or not, and then reflect on 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 how to how to handle that uh, uh, that situation. Uh, we we are. I mean, I, I'm conscious that we're we're running <laughs> running a little uh, late, but I, I I want to end uh, with one question uh, related to fragility, uh, federalism, and gender. Now. Uh, you know, since uh, Mr. Ayante was speaking, I, I'll, I'll start with you uh, in, in posing my question, which again comes from the audience. Uh, fragility is associated with violence and gender violence is a very large part of that. Uh, given that a lot of focus on gen gender inclusion has been forced by the international community, how do you get societies to own and internalize the importance of gender, gender equity, gender inclusion? Uh, in both in the process of peace building, but also in the process of institution building uh, going forward? That's an excellent question, uh, Rupak. And I would say that, uh, again, uh, the, the role of gender in each society is also rooted in culture and context, as you know very well. You know, in the global south, in, in many of our countries, in, in the Arab and Muslim world, um, uh, you know, uh, women haven't played uh, as much of a strong and prominent role as they are playing now in the West, although that's now changing um, quite dramatically. In the context of a, a country like Somalia, where the society remains very patriarchal, it is a struggle every day to try and, and create a gender parity. What we have done in our context is to create um, a frameworks that force the political elites to uh, uh, make sure that they are inclusive in their um, teams, in their political aspirations. Uh, and so, for example, in the last three elections, we've had federal elections. That is, there was a requirement that clans who are appointing people into the parliament uh, uh, include 30% of their representatives, at least 30% uh, 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 women uh, representatives. We have... Uh, from 2012 elections, um, the level of representation or female representation in the parliament was 14%. 2016, that was upgraded to 24%. Um, and so we are much closer to the 30%. So you have to create these quotas in societies where we know uh, are deeply patriarchal, where um, you know, a, an open competition would not necessarily favor uh, women. So that's one way to ensure uh, participation. Now, the other, uh, of course, way is to empower civil society. Uh, you know, key actors in our civil society are led by very vibrant, uh, very active, high profile women uh, who are not high profile in our country, but also high profile uh, around the world. Um, and I think that uh, it really uh, also is important because, uh, you know, you empower them uh, in, that, uh, in that process. Uh, what I would say, though, here, I think as a matter of, uh, of caution is, again, just as we were describing the federalism model, it's important that this does not come as a sort of a, a diktat from the uh, development partners. Oftentimes, that comes across like that. 
and it's not very well received in our context. Um, I think, uh, you know, yes, we have to do a lot of work to improve the role of women in our societies, but I think it would have to, we would have to nudge existing structures, i.e. The, the civil society, but also um, uh, encourage and, uh, the, the clans and, and other groups to uh, increase their participation uh, of women. And then finally also uh, youth uh, is another important uh, aspect to this. Mm -hmm. 70% of the populations in most African countries or more are from the young people. And over half of those are young women who are comparatively, you know, specifically in the case of Somalia, more educated, more vibrant, more active. So empowering them would also indirectly uh, empower um, or improve the gender parity in our societies. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, Ambassador Huber, uh, you, uh, uh, you, you, you've talked about the importance of including women in, in, in peace and uh, in peace processes and in dialogue processes. Uh, in, in our experience, we've found uh, often in countries, in post conflict countries where we've worked, that you see a lot of women who are economically empowered, who often are the primary bread, bread earners for their families. But when it comes to political processes, they seem marginalized. And as a, as, as, as a donor, uh, you know, your it would be it would be useful to get your perspective on how and how do you think we could more align uh, uh, the, the sort of the role of women we see as as economically empowered in these societies with bringing more into policy making, into governance, into politics. What what role do you think donors could uh, could play in this? Yeah, not not easy to answer. It's quite a, a challenge. But as you say, I think in economic empowerment, there are there are very good. There is good progress in in many countries to give more um, um, through education. Very often, skills development as well, empowerment, um, self esteem, and so on. Also to to bring women into more active roles, economic um, economically important roles, to be the breadwinners even of their of their families. Also giving them the or, or they, they finally get the, the opportunity also to invest more in the education of their girls. So it goes from one generation to the other and has more effects, I think, of bringing girls and women more into active roles in um, social, economic and also political um, development. Um, I would say, especially coming back to the to the federal type of uh, of systems, as you mentioned, in a in a system with three levels, it's surely most uh, easiest to start at the local level with involving women also at the political level. For the women themselves, it's surely easier. I mean, I can see that in our own society in Switzerland, even we have to motivate young women to become more active and to have the self esteem to be. Uh, to present themselves to be elected at local level it's also a, a, a process but so it's it's on one hand it's easier for the women themselves at local level and it's easier for society to accept that and to to get used to women playing an active role also in political functions to be elected to political office so starting at local level can then also have its effects to to provincial or, or, or national level uh, later on. So I, I would again come to the point of working at local level is um, is a very good entry point also for this, for giving women more uh, to, to strengthen the women's role in society. Um, yeah, and, and that can have national uh, effects uh, later on. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I agree with you. I mean, that's that's my experience as well, and I think that's that's a very important point uh, to be made there, uh, uh, Miss Lukman. You know, when we worked in Yemen, what was very surprising uh, for us, uh, you know, when we did these training, training and dialogues in Yemen, was to see a very high uh, engagement by by women of a particular demographic below a certain age, uh, which which we hadn't expected. And, and and so if you could if you could comment a little bit on on the on the role uh, that you see uh, women in Yemen playing in 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 reconciliation but also in building uh, uh, the, the future of Yemen in terms of whether it's devolved decentralized uh, federal yes uh, thank you for mentioning that uh, uh, Rupak. I think that um, we need to acknowledge one thing really uh, when we speak especially about uh, the MENA region and conflict uh, areas women and youth also um, 
should not be, and also elsewhere, should not be really seen as uh, only victims of uh, conflicts or war, or just be targeted for assistance, but they should be seen as leaders because they are. They have been leading uh, in many various um, initiatives, disasters, um, even we've also had also uh, nat natural uh, disasters. It's been the women who have been leading and the youth. Um, so I think they are um, really um, uh, essential for peace building, for reconciliation, for transitional justice, and also for the ceasefires. Um, and I think that we already have a very uh, good record. Uh, women have already been leading in these areas. They've been facilitating humanitarian assistance uh, and also mediating conflicts um, on the local levels uh, for water and land disputes uh, and resources. For instance, um, I was involved with my team um, uh, on ending a two-year uh, armed conflict uh, over water. And we were able to, um, um, to bring the, uh, the tribals, uh, tribes together. We uh, fixed the water station. We were able to bring also a holistic approach to the, uh, to the uh, project. And we put back 300 young girls back to school. So we brought in more than one aspect. Now we're also working on greenhouses and agriculture and livelihoods in the same area. So this whole area, has completely transformed now from a, an armed conflict into a peaceful area where people are working together. It's these kind of approaches that the women bring to the table. And that's why we're advocating so um, uh, much about, about um, women's participation. Um, and I think that um, uh, there is more than one um, um, role for the women to play. I think that they are um, excellent mediators. I've seen them, we've seen them. Uh, at the Stockholm, um, uh, in, in, in Stockholm, uh, we had only one woman, but we also had the tag team. They were not part of the, uh, they were not at the table, negotiation table, but they were the ones who were bringing the parties together and bridging the difference. Um, and I think that is really um, a role that the women really bring very well. We also have women who are, have been advocating for, um, uh, arms transfers for um, uh, also for, for stopping, I mean, arms transfers. Um, we have been uh, working on uh, a roadmap to peace in Yemen. Uh, we've also contributed to the, the recent Riyadh agreement with 10 points that were essential uh, for the Riyadh agreement. And we were the ones who uh, worked on that. And that included uh, military, um, the military situation and recommendations for how it should be um, uh, and the security uh, provisions of that agreement. Uh, we've also been working on uh, TAS. And so there are so many brave uh, Yemeni women out there with a lot of knowledge and expertise. And it's frankly um, an expertise that is just being lost because their voices are not heard, they're not included, they are having impact on the ground, and we need uh, a grassroots approach to end this conflict. Um, and um, I think that's where we uh, need to maintain more stronger relationships, and I'm really speaking about the international community here. They should provide more flexible funding for uh, women's-led organizations who are really leading not only peace building issues, but also development. Uh, projects that are essential right now for, for the Yemenis who haven't had their salaries for more than four years. And, um, and this is all contributing to reducing the violence. Um, and they're also reducing um, extremism by uh, many uh, ways and initiatives um, uh, in Yemen, and including uh, advocating for uh, the ending child recruitment and youth recruitment and um, uh, providing other projects for the youth. Uh, to mobilize them instead of joining the battlefields, but to work on either humanitarian projects or livelihood projects that give them a sense of income and a sense of dignity um, that prevents them from joining these, um, these groups. So I think this is really essential for fostering, um, the women are essential for fostering social cohesion also, and for conflict resolution uh, in general. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we have come to the end of this session. I just want to say, just to list uh, a few things I think uh, that are takeaways from this. The first, of course, is that governance is important 
and subnational and subnational government, uh, whether it's uh, particularly local governments, are a very important part of conflict resilience. The the second thing uh, is that I think in in uh, that that in in any uh, in in rebuilding after conflict, having a long term view is very very important. Uh, no no two systems are alike. No, you cannot export democracy. You cannot import a constitution. You have to have uh, you have to have local buy-in into the process of rebuilding uh, and establishing new constitutions, uh, new governance, uh, new governance arrangements. Uh, the next thing I think that to take away is uh, that I've said in the past: labels are not important. Uh, whether it's fed, whether you're a federation or devolved, decentralization, it doesn't matter. You need a system that works that delivers uh, the goods and services, the public good and services that people need. And last but not the least, it's very important to have a gender lens uh, on the whole process of reconciliation and, and managing fragility, uh, because without that, uh, you lose a very important perspective, a uh, perspective of half the population and the expertise of half the population. And you build institutions that don't meet the needs of, of your entire population and are not and are not uh, uh, and, and and are not inclusive in in the way they should be. Uh, this is a this is a conversation that could go on for several more hours over several more days. Uh, but I want to thank uh, take the time to thank our panelists for taking time out of the very very busy schedules to join us uh, this this afternoon this evening this morning. Thank you so much. And I, I would also be remiss if I did not thank my colleagues, uh, John Light, Liam Whittington, um, uh, uh, Asma Zerbi, uh, Deanna Chebanova uh, for helping put this together, uh, as well as our two translators uh, who've been working uh, on, on, on English, French, French English, uh, on the French English channels. So thank you very much. Uh, I wish you all a good, good week. And uh, Specifically to to uh, Ms. Lukman, uh, Mr. Ayante, I I wish you uh, a good iftar. Uh, I guess this is getting close to the time where you you will be breaking your fast. So I wish you all well. 